Hello and welcome to Film Obsessive. I'm Paul Johnson. I'm here today interviewing Nyla Alkaja, who is director of the new film entitled Simply Three. That is just one of her many accomplishments and Nyla is generous enough to take time from her schedule to speak with us today. Um, Nyla, can you tell us where you're speaking to us from and what you're currently working on? Hi, how are you? Um, I'm so glad to be with you here again after three years. Three keeps following me everywhere. I am actually um, in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. And um, yeah, it's been such a journey because I shot this film in the middle, in the midst of, um, in the middle of COVID. It's just recently completed now uh, after that time that you've invested in it. And um, can I have you tell our audience in your own words what three is about? Sure. So in three words, it is ex uh, it's exorcism in Islam. And in more words, it's about a mother and how far she'll go um, to save her son against different adversities in the context of, um, you know, Arabian challenges and uh, whatnot, because, you know, she's divorced, so it's pretty, um, it's a taboo topic, and then she has to raise this boy who's very difficult and coming of age, you know, he's 13 years old, and he has to combat his inner voices, so it is a film about possession, but it, the treatment of it is, I would say, is very, very different than many of the exorcist film that keep coming in the market, you know, and I try to stay away from cliches, and I try to be as um, re realistic in my um, filming as much as possible. You know, it was about three years ago that you spoke to our Jason Shepard. And at that time, I think you were really just, just in the very seeds of planning this film three. And what was it to drive you to make that? What was it that drove you to make this film? I lived the story. Um, it's based on a true story. It's a base, it's based on a true story that happened in my family where I was in front of the person who was not well for almost um, a year and a half. And I saw how uh, distraught the mother was. It almost broke the family apart. Um, there were a lot of um, mullahs, as we call them, which is equivalent to priests who come and exercise the kid. And I um, I sat there watching this child scream in agony. And there were just some super horrific, you know, incidences and, and that I just can't get rid of my, uh, you know, out of my system. And I feel like making these films weirdly is also therapy in the same time, because it was, it was a very, very difficult period. And, you know, we almost lost him. Um, so as much as it's horror, it's also a psychological drama slash kind of like um, the horror of losing your child. It sounds like just an incredible experience. And I mean, I'll confess, I'm someone whose only knowledge of this comes from having watched films and largely from Hollywoodized treatments of this. Um, I'm just so interested to hear anything more you might have to say about what the actual experience might be like. And then we can talk a little bit about trans translating that into cinema. Yeah, so the actual ritual that takes place in the Islamic world is very different than, like, let's say, uh, Christianity or Judaism and any other religion. Because um, when I did my research, there were 25 cases that I was following besides the case that I lived through. And um, the most severe way of exercising a person is using the method of uh, using cotton or what we call it as cottoning. Um, which is really unheard of and probably never captured on film. I mean, I say this, maybe someone did, but I haven't, I've never seen it myself. Um, and it's where they stuff the nose and ears and mouth of a person to a point where they can't breathe because they feel that by doing so, it it suffocates the the devils in you and they find a way out, you know, and, and they just don't stay in your body. So it's just a, a school, an ideology, not every... Mullah believes in this. It's the extreme method, but because I've seen it happen, I wanted to uh, capture that um, and to showcase that there are kids that go through this extreme method. I don't think it happens anymore. The story is an old story. It was in the um, late 90s. So I, I haven't heard of cases that go through that extreme method. But since it has happened and it probably happens in rural areas now in different areas um, and, and different countries uh, in our vicinity, um, in the region, I mean, um, then I won't be surprised if it the cottoning process still happens. 
And it is something that we see on screen in three. And I'm just wondering um, what you're striving to do cinematically to try to present um, not only just technically the logistics of an exorcism, but also the, the, the feelings of horror and terror that are there for those who are involved. Yeah, I feel like, you know, the, the mother who is this modern character um, lives in Dubai, runs her own bakery. You know, she doesn't believe in this. Obviously, she knows the kid has a mental issue. But since she's in the in a heart and, you know, she lives with her sister and family that are conservative, she has the, she has that battle. And then she has the battle of the British doctor, Jefferson Hall, who is an Oppenheimer and other films uh, like House of Dragon, he's Lord Lannister playing the twin. So he was my doctor, uh, Mark Holly, who gets involved in the story. And I, I like that because in, in the real story, we had uh, an, uh, a, albeit he was German, but we had, you know, um, a, a doctor from the West who gets to see the story. He's not saving anyone. He's there to get lost with the characters. Uh, because he builds this affinity with her and her son. They feel very comfortable with him. He's very compassionate. And he, too, feels the same kind of... He connects with this family. He's not very verbal. Um, it's all like body language. But you can see that there's that connection. They, they almost make a beautiful family if it was... If it weren't for those like restrictions and limitations, you could just see that Miriam would end up being with Holly and he would, you know, take her son under his wings. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, it's it's not that the situation is not of that case. It kind of reminds me, reminds me of a movie that or a book that I really loved reading, Remains of the Day. Um, not sure if you heard of it, but I think there was a bit of inspiration coming from there. Um, obviously, that part is embellished. That was not really in, in real life. The mother barely had time to scratch her head. Um, and I also wanted to say that thematically, there are some themes that are very original uh, in the sense, original in the sense that have never been filmed con like in this context, where um, the, the, the kid's um, left toe is fused with the adjacent toe and that that's where the let's say possession metaphorically and physically took place because in our culture anything left is sinister so having something happening to your left body part is a sign of um, unwashed sin so I just kind of like the fact that she's the, she's the mother of sin almost like the main character because she's carrying the sin of not being pious of not praying of not doing these things that are expected of her you know and then she has to kind of she's in a forest of people who are trying to impose these ideologies and she's fighting it off but in the middle of the movie she kind of loses hope and takes the religious route because nothing works medically for the kid um, as I said like the treatment is more on the drama side than the kind of you know jump scares and the traditional you know levitation we don't have any of that stuff in the film and it, that's why it probably feels very real that people do connect with my characters because it, it really does feel like a problem that can exist but the solution they used to solve to help this child was very extreme you know, I will credit you in particular for the character of Maryam and also the uh, actress who plays her uh, does an excellent job. Uh, she seems like a woman who is really uh, caught between different belief systems and also really driven by uh, nothing more. It's apparent through most of the film than her, her love for her child and her desire to see him uh, well and whole again. Um, I'm wondering if there were, uh, if there are filmmakers who have uh, influenced you or whose work you wanted to diverge from in the making of three. Um, in the making of three, perhaps a lot of like Arab filmmakers um, from North Africa. I love works, you know, the Moroccans do really well. Also Iranian cinema inspires me. Um, I would say from, I'm just trying to think of names from the West, nothing comes off my head. I mean, there are like these big commercial directors that I really, really do appreciate, but I think most um, of the cinema, uh, I'm, I'm inspired by Iranian cinema a lot. So, yeah. Um, and I wanted also to give some credit to the actor who plays the possessed boy, uh, Ahmed. Um, his name is Saud, uh, correct? Uh, also Rooney. Um, I think 
just looking at the press materials, he's he's 16 today. I'm assuming he would have been, what, 14 or so, 13 perhaps during filming. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And um, he actually gave, you know told me later that he gave me a white lie because the the poster said 12 or maximum 13 so he's like I was I was actually 14 plus going on 15 when I told you I was 13 so <laughs> I didn't really check. <laughs> but it's it's amazing because he's never done he's never been on film before he's never acted in a not even in a short like he he has some experience with theater but he's never really done a, a movie before I'm wondering what you have to take into account with his youth when making the film, um, how much of the narrative uh, he is exposed to, um, what his uh, limitations are or strengths are as an actor that he can bring to the role, uh, perhaps especially during the exorcism scenes. Yeah, I. if you speak to him in real life, he is... He's so good at switching emotions where you feel like he's almost, he has mild schizophrenia. He does it deliberately to make me laugh, but he's he's so good with his timing. It's incredible. And just something that comes so naturally to him. Uh, he's very smart, bright, you know, uh, and it, it was someone who takes instruction and then he gives me more than what I expect. Like he always tries to push himself. But one thing I noticed, he was extremely depressed in some of the scenes because he has in real life a very broken relationship with his father. He hasn't seen his dad for a long time. And the and then this is a complete coincidence. And the kid in the film is the same, the character, Ahmed. So he almost kind of he he becomes Ahmed after a while when we're filming. And that's quite sad, but he does embody it really well. And you feel like it it is coming from a very, very authentic place um with Sarwood, the actor, the wonderful actor Sarwood, yeah. It does feel like that. And his role strikes me also is very well written in terms of his adolescence, that his uh, outbursts uh, that, you know, are related to his possession take take place at moments of uh, humiliation or shame or arousal or those feelings in adolescence that those urges that are difficult to control and in his case, uh, apparently impossible. And, you know, I, I had a really, really hard scene written and we weren't allowed to film it because we shot in Bangkok and, uh, you know, it, he, the, the, the kid, yes, me and his, his uh, friend, neighbor, um, when she visits, you know, there was a scene in the bathtub where we had to completely rewrite that because I, I couldn't film what I had. Uh, originally written which was based on a true story so I couldn't do that I'm a little bit gutted but I understand because they're children and you know it, it there's a lot of like red tape around kids I get it but um, I really wanted to uh, capture the the fear the girl went through in real life where you know in, in real life he just it was kind of grotesque he had his tongue like all over her ear and and reading like you know Quranic verses it was pretty disturbing but we obviously we couldn't do that you know I had to find a solution where I'm close to it where I'm kind of alluding or insinuating that feeling but without actually physically doing it some people think it, it worked better that there was that you know tense anxiety that people felt uh, towards Yasmin uh, but yeah th those were the th there was few scenes which where we had to um, sacrifice because of censorship. I get it, you know. I understand too, and I don't know personally that I would need to see exactly what happened. I know, I mean, I know from the film that that something bad is about to happen, and that something bad did happen. I don't know that I would need to see exactly what what did happen there. Oh. But I also understand, you know, as a filmmaker, you want to be able to, you want to be able to shoot and produce that which you've written. Yeah, and one thing I wanted to say, and it's it's I think filmmakers who are watching this, if you have made a film and you have a young boy, ADR, I mean, that bit me really hard because when I met him after in post, his voice completely transformed. And I said, Sarod, you actually sound like the devil for real now. Like it's so thick and scary. It's like, where's that little innocent boy? It's gone. So I couldn't ADR him. And I had to, you know, kind of make the best of what I what I uh what we had. <laughs> I'm also curious, uh, what, what else goes into the scenes? Like I saw, for instance, a credited uh, contortionist. Yes. So we, yes, of course we had, um, it's, you know, it's grueling to 
scream constantly and and you know be a bull and wrestle and all that stuff and you have men holding you down and you know and so basically we had to have two body um double so we had a a kid his age um who took over when ahmed was tired and then we had uh, the contortionist who did some of these crazy hand moves so as you can see we didn't go too gung-ho or too crazy with the supernatural stuff because I wanted the script to feel more real than not and I know that like the ending is to me very metaphoric but it can also mean that perhaps the curse perhaps never left this family you know um but yeah so the the little moments or the few moments I used with VFX they're they're not too many but I think they're effective because when they do happen you appreciate them and it's not like you know flying saucers and plates flying everywhere like in you know in most of the films I try to avoid doing that so. it also strikes me uh Nyla is a film that works uh very much like a maternal melodrama right uh where a, a young mother um and very often a, a single mother is really uh working to uh, resolve a conflict in the best interest of her son and pulled in different direction by those tensions. So um, this is a film that that's clearly clearly grounded in psychological horror, but also works on some other principles that are more based on the relationships between the characters as well. Correct. And you can also see that the the themes of jealousy, and what we call in our culture, I don't know if any of the North American countries or sorry, uh, states have it, which is what we call the evil eye, like someone jinxes you basically. So here it's very deep rooted. And I know like in some um, areas around the world, like let's say for instance, in Italy and Sicily, they really believe in like the evil eye. So, um, and that's why like they don't, you know, publish stories of their children online just in case they get the evil eye. So you can see the sister embodies those um Kind of schools of thought and how startlingly different she is from Miriam Nora and I thought Nora did a great I would say like Nora is the spice on our biryani because she she brought that spice you know to the film where with her kind of dry humor and um you know and and I and people thought like she had uh she was the reason behind everything because obviously she's not as successful or let's say as pretty or she didn't have kids so she had she longed for Miriam. She wanted to be Miriam, but she couldn't. You know, I wanted to ask you to Nyla, as a female director in the Arab film industry, if there are others who have, I mean, and you're, you're really one of the, one of the first, if not the first, if there are others who have influenced you or mentored you along the way, um, and maybe also how you see your own vision as a filmmaker as you forge a new new path for yourself in this industry. Yes. Yeah, so when it comes to mentorship, um, I am the first female film director in my country. So there wasn't really like, uh, you know, a pool of people that I could just, you know, ask to support and hold my hand in the journey. But I have Credit always where it's due, like Ismail Farooqi, a wonderful director, Masoud Amrallah. There has been some uh, good, solid names in art industry, men, who really were so just very, very, um, almost like father figures in the sense that they really took care of me in that way and helped me along the way to uh, watch international independent cinema, expose me to the to that kind of uh, independent indie film world. Um, and that had impacted me. Actually, my father would probably be the first person I should credit because he, this is all by, by complete sheer coincidence, he didn't know he was doing this, but he was actually collecting films and he had the biggest film collection anyone could imagine. You know, talk, I mean, starting from Betamax and VHS and, you know, growing up, I, I think I watched The Exorcist when I was eight, which is, of course, I shouldn't have done that. But he, there was this brown cupboard and I was, um, I'm short, I'm still short, by the way. So I would like go on a on a stool and have this magic key and this key would open this closet of, you know, another world like of movies. And I would sneak them because I wasn't allowed to watch and I would take a film each day and my nanny would make sure that no one watches and we'd watch the film together. I'd even like tie the, my, um, sleeping blanket around my neck to save like two, three seconds. So if he comes, we have everything like, we take out the VHS, lock the cupboard, I would run to my room and the blanket would come on top of me right away um, because I was obsessed with his collection. So I'm sure that's where the, as they call it, love fever started at a very young age. Um, and yes, and now I see it passing on. I have, what when people ask me like, 
what's for you what does success mean to you and and for me it's the impact you know when i see young adults sending me emails and now mostly on instagram how they would love to intern with me how i've been you know impacting them i speak a lot at universities so to a lot of them i'm their role model so it's it's very endearing it's really beautiful because it comes from a very 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 deep place in them and they need that they need more examples like myself so that they can be able to get and, and and tell stories. It's easier now to tell stories than any time before because of streamers in the Arab world and because there are like now more women obviously doing it and men, but it, I think um, than any time before, this is a wonderful time to inspire the a younger generation. And obviously I have to help myself to help them. So the idea is um, after three, something magical happened to me. I, I also got um, signed up by Zero Graffiti Management uh, with Sarah Arnott, who's my manager. And she's now bringing me international projects um, to my attention, which wouldn't have happened if obviously I didn't finish my first feature film. Now, the congratulations for that. And honestly, thank you so much for sharing that uh, anecdote, uh, your superhero origin story, if you will. Uh, it I'm really honored and privileged just to have heard that. It, it's really, truly affecting. And uh, your passion uh, and your talent for your filmmaking really does come through. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, audiences internationally being able to see more of your work in the future. Uh, where and when can people see three? Um, so at the moment, I have uh, Vox Distribution distributing all around MENA region, um, and we are speaking to some parts of Asia and North America. We still don't have um, theatrical over there, um, but I believe that once I have a good case study, if it does well in one of the, uh, one of these countries, it will have a rollout in Asia, and that will automatically help me roll out in uh, different territories. Fingers crossed. Um, but if anyone wants to see or have a flavor or try to see my work, I do have two films on Netflix. Um, I'll buy not feature films; they're shorts. But the Shadow, which was the proof of concept for this film three, is actually on Netflix and it's airing or it's streaming in over 130 plus countries. So. Yeah. The shadow. I will include that link in this interview, uh, Nyla. And um, are you working on another horror film in the future or are you uh, diverging out into different genres? Uh, yes, indeed. I'm actually filming end of this year and the funding's in place. Everything is in place, ready to go. Probably next month we're going to be rolling. Um, the reason why it's end of the year is because of the weather. Otherwise, we would have been able to shoot it in the summer. Um, so it is a beautiful um, goth, <laughs> dark again, uh, psychological horror, but more on the fantasy side. And it's about the five stages of death uh, narrated through the left ear of a woman who has tinnitus, the disease. Um, and it's every stage of death is manifested through a creature in the mountain. Um, it's a really stunning, I think visually, it's a very surreal film. And I have to say this, uh, I was very, very fortunate that uh, two-time Oscar winner, Ayar Rahman, uh, read the script and gave me a, you know, and his manager said that was the quickest 24 hours he signed on the script because he it really inspired him. And he's going to do the, um, his first Arabic song. He's done over 160 films, like Slumdog Millionaire, you know, a lot of uh, Danny Boyle's movie. He's composing the main song. Um, and it's a very strange wedding song because it's uh, a human marrying a creature. So it's an unholy union. Um, so that that's going to be very uh, interesting to see once it's done. That is interesting to hear about, and I'm looking forward to that. I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to visit us uh, at Film Obsessive today, Nyla. Wish you the very best of success with three and with all of your future projects. Uh, I just want to say also, it's so important for the film industry uh, in every country to be able to tell stories from diverse perspectives, from diverse uh, authors, uh, directors, uh, and origins. And your filmmaking is something that seems very deeply committed to that. So we just wish you the very best with all your work. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Film Obsessive. And more than ever now is the time for people to connect. And I hope that film, if anything, brings us closer together because it's a, it's a language that everyone understands. I really do appreciate your time and having me on your show. And I hope more people watch uh, in, you know different cinemas because I think, if anything, it does bring peace. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you so much.